Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love and War Games. Today we are going to have a look at how to start the Empire faction for Dystopian Wars. This is actually going to be an, anal an analysis of the Empire starter set and we will take this opportunity to talk about their fluff, their playstyle, what do you get inside the starter set, uh, how you should build these uh, units that are in the starter set, what type of lists you can build, and finally how you can expand from there. Uh, the Empire starter set is the one that really <laughs> needs, I think, this kind of video because there are so many options that you can have. But before we have a look at this, let's talk a little bit about their fluff. Indeed, what is the Empire? On the map shown here, it's all these territories in red there. So as you can see, it consists of most of the Asian nations, and they are quite different to their real-life counterpart, uh, unlike, for example, the Crown, which is just steampunk British Empire. Those have a really interesting history, and uh, I would not like to, uh, <laughs> to spoil, but basically there are six or seven smaller empires in there, and each are led by what an emperor or an empress, and they seem to be almost immortal, or at least they're like, uh, when one of them die, like they get inherited by their descendants very fast, and they are all linked, uh, apparently telep telepathically. Uh, it's almost paranormal in how strong they are with psychic powers, and uh, it seems to be like they have almost a hive mind, and some might question uh, how, how it happens. Well, actually, it, well, it's a little spoiler alert for those that play Wild West Exodus, but uh, they are all touched by the entity known as the Hex, which is an alien entity, and uh, usually it causes some uh, quite uh, <laughs> an un unwelcome consequences for the those that are touched by the Hex, but in case of the Emperor and the Empress of the Empires, uh, this allows them to gain a lot of power, and yep, they just have these eternal rulers that drives them forward and brings a lot of unity towards these nations that otherwise would be fighting each other. So that is uh, basically who they are. They have been, oh no, something important, they have been isolated for a long, long time in history. And unfortunately, uh, they were awoken by a combined attack by the Commonwealth and the Crown. And now they started to be like, okay, well, even if we try to stay on our own, we are being attacked by other nations. So they start to expand a little bit more to make a more commerce in the Pacific area. And basically coming to clash a lot with the Crown, with the Commonwealth and the Union. So now that we know that they are basically a united Asian nation, uh, how do they play? Well, as you might expect, uh, these nations are quite different from each other, and it does mean that you have a lot of diversity, uh, whether you're bringing Chinese ships or Japanese ships or Korean ships, etc. So we need to talk about what each of these nations or sub-factions, we can call them, do good. Uh, the Chinese, for example, uh, have a lot of weapons that are actually flamethrowers and they use templates with this and this is really devastating and they do a lot of damage at point blank. They also have some quite good tricks uh, for boarding actions with their kind of like ninjas that you can send around and uh, yeah they're just uh, extremely efficient at point blank. If you want to stay at long range with the Chinese it's actually also possible because uh, they're really good with rocket uh, firepower which uh, excel at long range and uh, most of their long range weapons and also their flamethrowers have uh, the alchemical capacity which means that uh, you can start to pile disorder tokens on your opponent very fast and uh, this can cause uh, very quickly uh, even more criticals and uh, even more disorders and points of damage etc and you can really pile up the disorders on your opponent and this is what the Chinese do they also have paddle wheels which means they have a lot of mobility and yep just a, a good uh, affection uh, for those that want to start the Empire the Japanese now these are the ships that you do get in the Empire starter set doesn't mean that they are the main faction of the Empire, but they are supposedly their main naval power, so they are, are, have the most uh, default uh, ships, as you would say. And in these, indeed, they don't have a lot of tricks, but they are extremely efficient for their point cost, and probably some of the most point efficient ships of the entire game. They are usually quite resilient, they are tougher than other ships for the same point cost, and they are very hard to sink, and they have 
very, very good submarines, because technically it's naval ships, so they also are, have a big focus on submarines. They have some very interesting super units that we'll see in a, in a moment. And uh, yeah, they are just extremely resilient, and they have a very good rule, uh, which is not exclusive to, to them, but all these Japanese ships have them, which is Shadow Hunter, which means you can redeploy uh, at the end of the deployment phase. So they can really be where they want to be, and I cannot overstate how powerful this rule is. And finally, we have the Koreans. We don't have their ships yet, but they uh, they are in the orbit already. And the Koreans are focused on uh, air power. So they uh, are the masters of all the sky fortresses that will be in the game uh, probably this year. And uh, they're, we're going to talk about them more when they are released. But just know that if you want to play mostly aerial units, you will want to focus more on the Koreans and thus wait maybe a little bit longer. Now that we've said this, what do you actually get inside this Empire starter set? Well, you do get quite a lot. First of all, you have the Congo Heavy Battleship, which is this resin ship right there. Uh, it's a, an absolute beast, as we will talk about in a moment. And it does now have a named variant. You also have two Japanese frontline cruisers, which are those. And as you can see, <laughs> there is a lot of variants, seven variants. So we really need to explain them, and this is why this video is needed, because when you start to look at the instructions, it's like, okay, which of those seven variants do I build? I can only have two cruisers, but we'll talk about that. Same fight with the Japanese support cruisers. I'm not sure how it's going to be called. Maybe it's Japanese submarine cruisers. I, I don't know their official name yet, but it's basically those large submarines here, and you have six variants. So again, we really need to take a moment to discuss of all of those. Then you have four Kyoto fast frigates, which are those uh, little ships here. Uh, then new units that are exclusive to this box are the Sakata Heavy Destroyers, are he they are here. Uh, by the way, I didn't specify, but all the Japanese submarines are exclusive for now for the Empire starter set, so if you want them, this is the only place to get them. You do also have two Japanese Hunter submarines, which are these little mass ones here. And you have a lot of escort tokens, eight escort tokens, which are those cheetahs here. Very good. They uh, we will talk about them uh, a little bit uh, in detail because they they are worth it. You have two SRS tokens, which are those aircrafts here. And interesting, you have two exosubs tokens, which are actually they can only be sent by one variant of all these ships, which is a submarine variant. But they are really efficient, so we will also discuss them and know that you have two uh, of those exosubs token. And last but not least, you have a lot of stuff on, in addition. You have a lot of goodies. You have dices, you have the rulebook uh, up to date. You have some cards, which are vital if you want to play. Uh, movement tools, which are even <laughs> more important. Uh, you have all the tokens you might need, and you have a full-size map of the world. Like, you have a lot of goodies. If you want to start the game and you're like, okay, I don't want to buy the two-player starter set, just buying once this Empire starter set is going to be a, a good purchase because you will have everything you want in one place. Actually, it's priced very aggressively at £60, and uh, if you want to play the Japanese, uh, I would highly recommend buying two of these Empire starter sets, because as you can see, there are so many things you can build with uh, those ships, like so many variants, and uh, you do want to have two Kongos, especially if you build one of them as the Oni. So there is it's really a good plan to buy twice the Empire starter sets. For some factions, it's not as useful as for others, but the Japanese are probably, like the Empire is probably the faction for which you want two starter sets. And we'll start talking about the Congo Heavy Battleship. So what is it? Uh, let's first talk about the default variant, and then we'll see what is the only. The uh, Congo Heavy Battleship, it's incredibly resilient. Like, it has Armor 8, which is uh, normal for a battleship. It has Citadel 17, which is already, I think it's the highest Citadel value of the entire game. It has 9 hull points before it starts to degrade, and then it has 4 more. And it has an internal shroud generator. That is insane, and this is probably one of the toughest ships in the entire game. It has 9 ADV, 6 SDV, which is also higher than what you usually get. And then you can take those Cheetah Escorts, which will, first of all, make him even more of a threat at point blank, and which will even further increase its defensive. It's really meant to be the anchor of your fleet. You just put this guy in the middle, and it will just not die. It is extremely resilient, and it's uh, maybe not as uh, strong as uh, some very offensive-oriented battleships, but it still has a very 
very respectable firepower, especially since it has focused gunnery, giving it a little bit more dice is fine, but giving it a full, like a reroll of the blanks on all the gunnery weapons. So if you go for a broadside and you use heavy firepower, this is really gonna hurt. This is its main way of attacking, like a broadside with uh, three heavy gun batteries and focused gunnery and heavy firepower, and nothing can look at it and be like, yeah, I'm fine. No, no, it will be a lot of firepower going to the opponent's way. And another thing that is very interesting for any version of the ship is that it has Shadow Hunter. Uh, as we said, like it's very simple rule, uh, once everybody has finished deploying, uh, you can redeploy any ship uh, with Shadow Hunter anywhere where it was supposed to be able to deploy in the first place. And this is great because you can just deploy it extremely aggressively and then depending on how your opponent deploys, at the end you can be like, ah, no, you know what, I'm gonna put it on the completely other side of the table. So all the players of other war games know how good a redeploy is for like one or two units, but when your entire fleet can do that, it's just so so much stress for your opponent because he doesn't know where you will be. So it forces your opponent to play very conservatively, or then you can punish him uh, if he deploys a little bit too aggressively. So this is the default Congo, and you have a named version which is the Oni, and it's really interesting. Uh, we thought the named version of the Congo would be like something more focused on boarding actions, but no, not at all. Uh, the Congo has a rear built, uh, like an uh, inbuilt uh, interface replacing the rear turret, and the interface uh, generator is something that does a lot of stuff. First of all, uh, it, you can use it, uh, it's a little bit complex, but basically you ignore any damage unless it breaches your Citadel, and Citadel 17 with all the ADV and Shroud, it's gonna be hard. Uh, but if your enemy breach your Citadel, then you have a generator offline critical damage, which is eh. Uh, but it's already a good defensive buff. And the Oni has a very special rule, which is the um, unexpected arrival, which means it can just teleport where you want. And the interface, the second part of the interface generator, is allowing you to go back to reserve, like to teleport back. So what you can do with the Oni, you can just use unexpected arrival one way or another and just drop in the rear of your enemy. Uh, do some damage. The enemy can try to fight, uh, shoot back at you, but you are so resilient it will really have a hard time. And then you can teleport back or like go back to an expected arrival with this interface generator and then pop again like somewhere else on the map. And this means that the Oni is really good as an harasser uh, unit. It's almost indestructible because you will put it at some place where it's gonna be quite protected from the enemy's heavy eater and it's so resilient that the uh, smaller ships will not be able to do uh, almost anything on him. And uh, it's also extremely good then to go to uh, fight the enemy's carriers that are staying hidden, this kind of thing, or to grab an objectives in the late game. So it's such a good uh, value, this uh, Oni. Um, it's not the same role as the Congo, which is why you might want both. The Oni is really there to harass the enemy, take objectives, and just be a threat in the enemy's backline, while the default Congo is meant to hold the center of the map and just uh, handle anything that the enemy can sh shoot at. So yeah, and yeah, both versions are really good and the Congo is definitely one of the best battleship in the game for its point cost. And then we start to have a look at all the Japanese frontline cruisers. So let's start with the most uh, basic version that you can build with it, which is the Osaka. The Osaka is, uh, for basic cruiser, it's amazing. Uh, it costs 105 points, which is not that expensive for a basic cruiser. It has two forward heavy gun batteries, already good. It has Citadel 13 which is uh, quite good for a basic cruiser. Usually it's the heavy cruisers that sometimes have this. It has elite crew, which means if your enemy tries to charge at you, you can just fight back really hard uh, in boarding actions. And finally, it has focused gunnery. Like this is insane. Focused gunnery, again, it gives plus two dice to a roll of, with a heavy gun batteries, for example, and you reroll blanks. So all this for 105 points is insane value. Plus it has Shadow Hunter. Like, in my opinion, this might be the best uh, standard cruisers of the game, like for the points. Others, you can have more tricks, if you play Sultanat or that kind of thing, you can have more expensive weapons that you can build. But if you just want a basic cruiser, uh, I think the Osaka might be the best one of the entire game. Like, the Japanese are all about having normal ships with not that many tricks, but they're just so good. And this is really, like, I cannot overstate how the Osaka is a good choice. If you want to build two Osaka with your box, or even four, four starts to be a lot but between two and three if you buy two boxes uh, it's a really good choice like one squadron of Osaka is always going to be a good call then you have the Hokkaido 
The Hokkaido is an upgraded version of, over the Osaka. Uh, it has a little rear turret here uh, in addition and uh, it has uh, qu quite a lot going for it. First of all, it goes from armor 6 to armor 7, which is actually a big deal. Uh, it loses focused gunnery, which is oh, so sad, like it, it really made the Osaka so efficient, but it gains flag barrage too, which means it doesn't need as much air cover and a squadron of three Hokkaidos is going to be tough. It has a uh, heavy broadside, which is big deal as well and it means that it really wants to be showing its uh, sides to the enemy to make use of the heavy broadside and the rear gun battery. So it's a little bit less uh, efficient offensively than uh, Osaka because the Osaka has focused gunnery. The Hokkaido is tougher with the higher armor and flag barrage and it's more meant to be a brawler like in the center of the map and if you make a pack of three of those it's going to be very tough very expensive as well but yeah it's really gonna be uh, efficient as well for 125 points per model but really good ship as well then you have the Kanagawa Ka sorry Kanagawa uh, this one costs only 90 points okay and <laughs> it's quite insane it has heavy broadsides and heavy torpedo salvo like <laughs> like th this is crazy like, okay it has only one heavy gun battery to the front but this is not its main weapon it has heavy broadside which means it really when it gets at point blank it's really going to be efficient and it has heavy torpedo salvo on top of that i mean having two or three of those is also really a good call it has maritime patrol as well which is like fine bonus let's not talk too much about it but it has it and ju just for 90 points if you buy two or three of those you're gonna have like for example, let's say you have three. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna be very cheap, 270 points. You're gonna have three of those ships again, Shadow Hunter, remember, and they are resilient for, for their point cost. And you're gonna have three heavy gun batteries, okay? Three heavy broadsides, which means at point blank you're gonna delete something, and three heavy torpedo salvos. So even if your enemy is at extreme range, it's gonna have a lot of torpedoes coming its way. Like this is also again a very good ship, and all the Japanese frontline cruisers are very efficient, and the Kanagawa is no exception. Then we go to the Honshu, which is uh, actually the uh, another variant of the uh, Kanagawa. It has a, a rear uh, gun battery. Uh, this one is like um, uh, interesting. It costs three points more. Okay, it loses maritime patrol, uh, which is fine. Uh, like you don't need it. It gains pack hunter, so it wants to be in larger units. Uh, the only thing that I really disappoint me is that it has standard broadside and standard torpedoes and this is really what made the Kanagawa so efficient and then I'm like eh. if you want a monitor maybe stay with the Kanagawa for now because it's not worth the upgrade pack hunter is fine but it's not worth losing your heavy torpedoes and heavy broadsides for sure then we go to the category of cruiser carriers which is unique to the Japanese and it's quite interesting it's like these carriers with uh, this little like ramp for throwing uh, aircraft in the rear so you have the Miyagi with one heavy gun batteries and the Okinawa with two forward heavy gun batteries let's first talk about the Miyagi it's quite uh, quite good like I mean it's 120 points and it has a capacity for SRS of 2 slash 2 which means even when crippled it's still going to uh, send two uh, SRS tokens so you need to remove all eight uh, hull points if you want to remove this carrier from sending its SRS. So that is quite uh, quite good. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's going to be quite good harasser. I would not recommend to build like three of those, but one Miyagi is going to be fine. And it has full steam ahead, which means that it is going to be where it wants to be very fast, especially again with Shadow Hunter. So yeah, a good ship. Uh, maybe to play more conservatively than others because uh, you do want to keep your SRS capacity. It is fine, maybe not as crazy efficient as the other ships we've talked about right now, but absolutely uh, relatable. Like if you want one, it's good. Then you have the Okinawa with two forward heavy gun batteries and also uh, SRS capacity. And this is like, I'm like, it costs 140 points, which is starts to be like quite a lot. It has armor 6, it is 12, so not that resilient. and eight hull points in total so it, it is a bit tough because it is it is a good ship like you have two forward uh, heavy gun batteries torpedoes you can send SRS very good very nice however uh, it's like <laughs> you will lose it fast because your enemy will see that it's very dangerous ship and it's not that tough compared to the rest of your fleet so it will attract some firepower and for this point cost it can be sunk relatively fast so I really like the concept of the Okinawa it looks great but it's not as competitive as it could be. However, what it has is uh, 
it is has Shadow Hunter again, and it has Vanguard, which means that before the first turn, it's going to redeploy and then make a move of 5 uh, inches anywhere it wants. Which means that when it activates, for example, at the beginning of the first turn, it's going to be quite close to the enemy, and it's great to send SRS token then, and then you can trigger Spotter if some other ships in your fleet have Spotter. So if, in this sense, uh, the Okinawa is absolutely great if you have a ship uh, now or later that really needs Spotter on the first turn. The Okinawa, like a single Okinawa, is a very good way to trigger this. Something to keep in mind, but don't build three of them. It's going to be very expensive, and they're going to be sunk uh, too fast. And it's not finished, we see the last variations, which is the Ishikawa and the Yamaguchi, which are the versions with the little, uh, how we call this, uh, cheetah uh, escort tokens in the rear. So they can throw them in the fluff and repair them, etc, etc. So let's first start with the Ishikawa. The Ishikawa is uh, fine, like it has Mine Later, which is uh, good, and Moon Pools, which is going to boost uh, your little cheetahs at point blank, which is fine, and it's a good way for 110 points to get Moon Pools in your fleet. Uh, having one Ishikawa is not a bad uh, choice, and I can absolutely uh, recommend it. And then you get the Yamaguchi, which costs 20 points more than the Ishikawa, so it's already 130 points, but you do get a lot. You get Armor 7, which is great for a ship uh, that starts to cost a lot, because Armor 7 is a very important thing to, to get for your survivability. You get a second heavy gun battery, already good, and you get a focus gunnery. Like, and this, uh, uh, as you might understand from now, focus gunnery, it's a really good role, especially when you have two forward heavy gun batteries. It also has a better fray for the Ishikawa, so you can actually put the <laughs> cheetahs on uh, your squadron of Yamaguchi already, and they're gonna be efficient. You can only have two of those, two cheetahs on your Yamaguchi squadron, but uh, they are a good recipient because you can start to shoot and make good boarding action. Like they're really good, and even without the moon pool, uh, they are still uh, they are still very good ships on their own. I mean, if you really don't plan to take any cheetah at all. Uh, maybe take other ships like Osaka or the Hokkaido. But even if you just want to put the cheetahs on the Yamaguchi themselves, yeah, they're gonna start to be a little bit more uh, expensive, but they're gonna be a real threat at point blank. And again, the moon pool is not only for the Yamaguchi, but also for ships around. So if, for example, uh, just a little tip, if you bring a Congo or and uh, only with three or four cheetahs, uh, keep them close to the Yamaguchi, and that's gonna be a really good solid package to hold the center of the table with. And that's it for the Japanese frontline cruisers. As you see, there is a lot of variation. If you're really starting the game and you're like, okay, I'm just gonna start to see how it's played, and later I will buy more boxes, I would recommend starting with the Osaka or the Hokkaido. Probably the Osaka, actually. They are very simple, but very efficient. And uh, if you want some other versions, uh, when you start to be, be more experimented with the game, I would also recommend the Yamaguchi as well, at least one of them uh, at some point, because it's a good ship. Two of them, I think it's uh, the sweet spot, but at least one is really good if you, start, if you want to make use of all the cheetahs that you get in this box. And finally, you have the monitors, which are super efficient, but they are more like competitive ships than... Uh, like, I, I'm not a huge fan of monitors usually, they're quite small, I'm like, ah, oh, I like big ships, but they're very efficient especially the Kanagawa, it's incredibly efficient for the point cost, recommended. And finally the Miyagi and the uh, ah, uh, what, uh, Okinawa are very fun, I love the concept, but they are a little bit overcosted and too fragile for what they do. And now we go for something that a lot of people were anticipating, which are the Japanese support cruisers, submarine cruisers, basically all the mass 2 submarines that you can have with the Japanese. So those are very new, uh, I did not have the opportunity to play them yet uh, on the table, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, what they can do each of them, and if I think they are uh, good for their point cost. First of all, you have the Kansai, which is the most uh, default submarine you can have. It costs 100 points on the nose, and it has one single heavy torpedo salvo. Okay, uh, that is uh, fine, but uh, okay. It gets Submarauder, which is something the other submarines uh, get. And it means you can a little bit, like, let's say, teleport from one turn to another. But I don't think the Kansai actually wants to do that. Because if he does that, uh, you will lose some turns where you will not be able to shoot. And it will shoot when he arrives. 
at uh, not at full capacity but at crippled value and for a ship that has a heavy torpedo salvo you could just stay in the back of the map and just uh, shoot all game long uh, plus it already has yeah it already has uh, shadow hunter so it's like do you really need submarauder to teleport in the rear of the enemy fleet uh, i'm not sure like it, it is a good uh, submarine i'm just thinking the submarauder rule is not that needed and actually they are some much more efficient ship than the Kansai if you want to do this which is staying at extreme range and just shooting all game long but maybe there is something I don't see with the submarine rule but I don't just don't think uh, teleporting one or two uh, submarine in the rear of your opponent's line is that efficient in a fleet that uh, doesn't need to do that you can, your submarines have really good options for staying in the rear of your own defensive lines then you have the Ryujin, which is basically the Kansai, but it, it costs 50 points more per model, so okay. And you gain a heavy alchemical rockets, which is this big uh, artillery thing here. And you gain Skyfire, which means that you reroll blanks against all the aerial models. So that is uh, already good. Uh, you don't have Submarauder, but as we've said, it's not a rule that you really want nor need. And this means the Ryujin is going to be quite efficient against a lot of things. If you have three of those, uh, or even just let's say two of those, if you build uh, both ships that you have in this box and this, uh, you're gonna have two heavy torpedo salvos, which is good. Uh, it's a big threat at 40 inches against anything. And then you're gonna have two uh, heavy alchemical rockets, which can shoot at full capacity almost at long range. And there, if you shoot at aerial unit, you can sky fire. So it means these two ships in their activation can send one big torpedo salvo on anything that is scheming or surface of submarines, and then shoot its uh, heavy alchemical rockets at anything aerial again. Or even if there is no aerial, it's still a big threat against any uh, surface naval ship. So really a good, good ship with a good firepower, and I like it very much. Then you have my favorite version of all these submarines, which is the Mizuchi. This one, first of all, the concept is amazing. It's uh, this submarine that can send these exosubs uh, tokens, like it's like smaller submarines, and it does cost 15 points more than a Kansai, so same cost as the Ryujin, but then you have the capacity to send two uh, slash one tokens, but be careful, this is not an SRS token. Uh, this is the, an exosub token, so it can not be intercepted, even with flag barrage or anything, it's not an SRS token. And it does a lot of damage. You have two ways of attacking. One of them is like a submarine attack, which will trigger your opponent's uh, SDV, but it's fine. Because this at attack is going to be like 5 dices per token, so a lot more than classic SRS. And it's going to be, you have a lot of keywords, but the most important one is devastating. So this means it's going to do a lot of damage to your opponent, and if you have two Mizuchis, that's going to be a lot of firepower. And if uh, you don't have any uh, surface ship in sight, you can, they can also use this SRS token, an aerial way of attack, which means they can uh, even attack uh, aircrafts in the air, which is amazing. Uh, this is a very efficient ship, and the thing that I like the most about the Mizuchi is that all its rules give it a very clear rule, which is you stay as far away as you can from the opponent. And with Shadow Hunter, you can be just at the exact perfect distance on turn one. And then you barely move and you just send a turn after turn, a heavy torpedo salvo, and you send your exosubs uh, every turn. And it's going to be extremely efficient. Uh, at this extreme range, you should avoid most of the enemy's firepower. You might be a little bit vulnerable from the enemy carrier, uh, but that's uh, the, that's the deal. Like you, you cannot be a, a completely OP ship either. But yeah, it's just this ship knows what it wants to do and it does it really well. Plus the concept is amazing. Then you have the Kagutsushi. This ship uh, is again kind of like the Kansai. You pay uh, 18 points more and you gain this uh, magma caster generator. Uh, on your ship. It's a little bit like the Commonwealth Cryo Generator in the sense that you can either shoot with it, it's a good uh, we weapon, especially at, like at point blank, or you can use it to make a special action to kind of like create islands, create volcanic islands uh, on the terrain, which is good. And uh, the thing that I like very much is that this uh, it gives you a lot of utility while you don't have any enemy at point blank of your magma caster and uh, it's the kagutsushi does not want to be charging but if the enemy has some marauders or unexpected arrival this kind of thing uh, and 
you will target your real line where your kagut sushi will be then uh, you can use this uh, magma caster to really have a devastating point blank weapons and that is going to be very uh, efficient in this regard not my favorite version but still very good then you have the Koromodako, which is this ship with kind of like the Cheetah or the Ika uh, version with all these tentacles. Uh, it costs 5 points more than the Kansai and it has a very good, like, efficient ramming action. And the very interesting thing is that it has bonuses for its actions against surface ships and or Colossus. And uh, this is where it gets I interesting. It only has a small torpedo salvo, but still it is a torpedo salvo. And the thing I like very much is that if you know that your opponent has Colossus, especially like these giant robots that like to pop up in your defensive line and just wreck stuff around, you can have one or two Koromodakos, which will contribute with their torpedo salvos, and once the enemy's Colossus arrive in your backline, you can use the Koromodako to really just rush at them and do a lot of damage with these tentacles, because you have a lot of bonuses against Surface or and uh, Colossus, and if they're both, it's even worse. And... Uh, the old uh, robots are both Surface and Colossus. So I see it more as a defensive ship, like it will contribute a little bit at long range, extreme range, and then it really protects you against the enemy's uh, deep strikers. And if the enemy does not have any of this, well, it's still a good ship to send on the, on the flank, and it has the torpedo salvo, and then it can just charge forward and try to grab something with its ramming action. The other version uh, is going to be the Umibosu, and this one is actually cheaper than the Kansai, which is not often that you get this. You, it also has only a regular torpedo salvo, same as the Koromodako, and this one uh, has a really good uh, offensive action. It has a uh, devastating keyword on its ramming action, which is great. It doesn't have any bonus, specific bonus against Colossus, Surface, etc. And yeah, what it really wants to do is to stay in strategic reserve, if possible, uh, then arrive on one of the flank of your opponent where he has some carrier or some weaker units, and not that much more, because then you can destroy the enemy with your ramming action, and then keep sending torpedoes from the enemy's backline for the rest of the game, or even go hunting for more with your ramming action. So I see it much more uh, offensive as uh, compared to the Koromodako, and it is going to be a great hunter for uh, carriers, for example, especially. But basically, it can be used against uh, anything. Then we have all the mass ones that you can get. Uh, there are three variants. Let's start with the Kyoto, which is the one that was already known, but uh, it has a lot going for it now. Uh, it, it is cheap-ish at 28 points per model, uh, it is fast, like it, it really fast, and at uh, Citadel 11 and 3 hull points, it's not going anywhere fast. For 28 points, it is relatively resilient. Plus, it has a good uh, gun battery now, because it's 5-3 uh, at closing range, which is a good gun now. And it has a giant slayer, which means that with a Shadow Hunter, uh, if you start to have quite a few of those, like uh, 4 or 6 Kyotos together, uh, you can really use Shadow Hunter to be where you want them to be, and hunt mass 3 uh, ships and with all these uh, bonuses like the giant slayer and the new gun batteries it's going to do a lot of things like a lot of things right so very good ship i like it very much then you have the sakura which is a new uh, ship it's the new mass 1 destroyer of the empire think of it like an excalibur of the crown which is the one that everybody knows and love uh, it is fine at 44 points per model. It has two gun batteries, okay, it's good. It has normal broadsides and light torpedoes. Light torpedo is a little bit sad. It does have giant slayer, which means that if you have a pack of four, it can absolutely threaten mass threes and more. Uh, it has less lethal than Excaliburs, it's absolutely true. And Excaliburs were fast as well with a Vanguard. However, uh, remember that the Japanese have Shadow Hunter. And on such a fast and threatening but relatively fragile ship, it is really good because you can really put them where they will be able to uh, make the most of their first and second turn uh, without getting uh, wiped out uh, from a blast attack uh, straight away. So really like the Sakuras and uh, they don't see them as, as uh, threatening and de <laughs> ship deleting as the Excalibur but they are going to be more reliable because they can really be where they want to be. 
And finally, last ship we're going to talk about is going to be the Chubu, uh, which is this very cute little submarine here. Uh, it's relatively cheap for a torpedo salvo. It costs 35 points per model. You can bring him squadrons of 6, so that's fine. It has Citadel 11, which is quite high for Mass 1 submarines, where we compare with what the other factions have. And I really like it. Uh, it's uh, not crazy efficient or anything, but it's fine. Like 35 uh, points for Torpedo Salvo is good, especially again with Shadow Hunter. We need to insist on this. And it's relatively resilient, so yeah, really good. One thing that is very funny is that they have Elite Crew for some reason, which means that you can go all the way to a pack of six, so it can really uh, go boarding very large ships uh, if you have a pack of six. Uh, I'm not sure that's how you should do it, but it's just very funny that uh, those uh, small submarines can go and board a battleship if they desire to. Uh, for those, I would re uh, recommend playing the Chubus either as very large packs, like 5 or 6, to really maximize their torpedo salvos, and when you start to have 5 or 6, it's very difficult for your opponent to deal with them, again, especially with elite crew, uh, or to play them uh, two by two because they're gonna be uh, always useful, you know, chipping away a hull point here and there, and it's gonna be a very cheap uh, activation at 70 points for two torpedo salvos. It's gonna be fine, and you can use this to um, make sure that you're uh, at the beginning of a turn, especially the first turn, your opponent has to play what he like all its units before you start to move in with your big hitters. All right, so now uh, what can we actually build with this box? I decided for once to not uh, tell you like, yeah, you could build this list if you buy this uh, other box. Uh, no, this is only uh, what you get with this box. First of all, a 750 points list uh, to learn the game with very simple ships. And well, I like all of this. First of all, a Congo, to which you will put a great wall generator uh, instead of the rear uh, heavy gun battery uh, to have a very tanky ship. Then two Osakas, because that's going to be always very efficient. Two Mizuchis because I love these ships and they're just so good and it's good that it starts to teach you how to play with tokens. And finally, two of the small Kyotos, which again are good ships, fast, and it's always good to learn. It's a good 750 points list. Uh, they are even say it's maybe a little bit competitive even, <laughs> let's not exaggerate, but it's a really, really good list and efficient uh, to learn the game. Like, okay, maybe it's not ultra competitive, but it's uh, you're not gonna lose uh, super fast with it if you don't don't know the game because these ships are resilient and they're good at what they do uh, put the congo and the osakas in the front the mizuchi is in the rear and the kyoto's on the flank and just enjoy and learn the game and then if you want to put the full box on the table you can have this list for about a thousand points which is a good uh, size to start to make uh, games uh, in an evening uh, first of all you can put the oni which is the named variant of the congo with three shitas uh, that's always going to be uh, efficient and good again two Osakas and two mizuchis i don't need to repeat what i said already but these are very good ships and very fun and always efficient uh, then you can bring two chubus which are these small submarines, again, cheap activation at 70 points, as you can see. A pack of four Kyotos, uh, those are going to be really good as flankers and hunting for the uh, enemies in Mass 3. They can be supported by three Sakadas, oh, sorry, I think I wrote Sakura before, but yeah, it's uh, Sakadas. And uh, those are also going to be uh, on the flank, probably, with Shadow Hunter, they are going to be where they want to be. And this is going to be a quite balanced and efficient 1000 points list. The Oni and the Osakas uh, in the center, Mizuchis and Chubus in the rear, and on the flanks, the Kyotos and the Sakadas. Uh, that's going to be quite efficient, actually, and uh, I think you're going to have a lot of fun with this. The, uh, your opponents also is going to have some good fun because there is nothing very frustrating in this list to fight against. Maybe the Mizuchi, if you play them good, but they're going to be fine. And yeah, they're just efficient, simple, and just very fun to play with and against. So, yeah. Uh, very good uh, lists to start the game with. Of course, it's just recommendations. You can build the boxes however you want, uh, depending on what you want. If you want to build two uh, Okinawas, very good as well. How to expand from there? Uh, first things first, uh, we are uh, in the middle of the month of March as we record this uh, video. Uh, there has been some rumors that we will soon have the Achiman 
Battlefleet set coming, maybe in April, maybe in May, but relatively soon-ish. And whenever the achievement is going to be released, probably it's going to be released with more submarines, like mass 2 submarines. And the Hachiman is a surface ship, but that can send exosubs. So if you uh, like the idea of having more Japanese submarines, it's going to be a really good box for you. The Hachiman is probably one of the best uh, capital ships of the Empire, and it's going to go extremely well alongside the Japanese, uh, sorry, Empire starter set. So we're not sure yet what it's going to be inside, but if it's just the Achiman and some submarines, and I don't know, a couple Sakadas as well, it's still going to be very efficient, and I would highly recommend it, because it's the Achiman is really needed in complement, just the single Achiman would be great on, in complement of the Empire starter set. But what if you want something like right now to expand? Well, there are a lot of good options. First of all, you have the Ika Colossus Squadron, which are we didn't talk about at all, but it's uh, quite good. Uh, you have these mass three giant squids, like octopuses, which are very efficient. There are two variants. One of them is with these lasers, like heat lancets, uh, more shooting oriented, and one of them has devastating ramming attack and both are very fun versions to play with. Uh, they combo extremely well with the Oni because then you can have a lot of uh, threats in the enemy's backline. But even without Oni, they, they are really good while your uh, Japanese ships all the centers. These Ikas can go uh, behind the enemy lights and just disrupt uh, your enemy's artillery ships or carries, etc. They're really good. They are quite cheap, uh, both in euros, like in pound, and in uh, points. And uh, they're quite large ships still, like uh, they, they do take quite a bit of uh, space. If you want to see them, uh, have a look at our Empire Starter Set unboxing, where we compare, uh, at some point I bring them out to compare them to uh, the new Cheetah tokens. And uh, yeah, uh, they go really well. If you would like a recommendation, I would recommend to build the one version that has moon pools uh, to uh, reinforce the Cheetahs, because then if you build build two of those with all the cheetahs possible, it's going to be a real pain for your opponent to deal with it. Another option uh, that I would recommend is the Heilung Battlefleet set, because if you buy the Empire starter set, you have all the Japanese ships, and the Heilung Battlefleet set, uh, we've made a what to build video about it quite recently, and I really think that it's a very good uh, auxiliary fleet, uh, because all the ships that you see there, you can bring them in an uh, Empire Faction Battlefleet, which will give all of those uh, strategic reserve. And if you do that, uh, first of all, it gives you a place to, if you want these uh, submarines that really want strategic reserve, these Japanese submarines, it gives you a place to uh, put them inside. Uh, they, can, they would go really well alongside with it. And even if you forget that, just uh, this ship, uh, this uh, fleet with the Heilong, which is this ship with the... Uh, and twin uh, flamethrowers and this uh, giant uh, dragon and some uh, frigates and destroyers and everything, you really can have a solid uh, 700 or 1000 points auxiliary fleet and uh, this is going to be a big threat on your opponent. So you will have your anvil, which is going to be your Japanese ships from the Empire Star set, and the hammer, which is going to be this Heglong Battlefleet set in one very efficient Empire Faction Battlefleet coming from the side with strategic reserves. So if you want some Chinese ships, but not that many, just a single Heilong Battlefleet box is going to be good. It's going to be give you a little bit of everything, and it's going to be enough to have this feeling of playing several nations uh, complementing each other very well. And finally, if you actually do want to have more Chinese and less Japanese, uh, because you really want to, at some point, have a large Chinese fleet, then I would highly recommend, uh, either alongside the Elong Battlefleet set, or even on its own, I would recommend the Ningjing Battlefleet. It's, I think it was the first box ever released for the Empire, and it's still really good. Uh, you do get this Ningjing uh, battleship, which is great. It has uh, the uh, Keying in the name variant, which is great. And even better, you can build it as the command ship, the Yangtze, which has fortunes of war, uh, really, really precious, and logistical support. So the uh, if you do buy this box, I really recommend the Yangtze. Fortunes of war and logistical support is great. It's an amazing combo. Uh, build it like this, I would recommend. Uh, it's just a great ship. Then you have two Chinese uh, frontline ships and four Shanghai frigates. Uh, you have a lot of options. If you want to see a little bit more about which uh, Chinese ships you can build, uh, I 
recommend you to have a look at the Heilong Battle Fleet set uh, What to Build video because we talk about all the Chinese frontline cruisers options. And uh, yeah, really solid box. And again, it gives you a little bit more of the feeling uh, of having all these na nations uh, fighting together, which is what the Empire is all about. And that is going to be it for this how to start with the Empire faction through the Empire status set. I hope this video was informative. If it was, please remember to give us a thumbs up. It really helps. Let us know in the comments if you are already an, an Empire player or if you are going to start now with this Empire starter set. Let us know uh, if you prefer more the Japanese or the Chinese and how you're going to build all of those. I'm quite curious about which is your favorite version of the Japanese frontline cruisers and submarines, the Mass 2 submarines, because there are so many variants and I'm pretty sure like there's maybe a combo that I didn't see. Uh, for me, I really like the Osakas as the frontline cru uh, surface cruisers and the Mizuchis, as you have seen in the lists I offered. But what are your favorite uh, versions? Is there something even more efficient than those or more fun or probably a combo that I didn't see? So let us know in the comment all about this. And until the next video, take care of yourself and remember to keep spreading the love all around you. Bye!